Welcome to thermodynamics. We are on. Um, <clears throat> it's the last bit of the chapter about uh, entropy, at which point we have all of the tools we're going to need, and we can then now we can start talking um, thermodynamics. Uh, but only if the computer works. So we got uh, one more example. This one is um, a compressor. So the compressing air would be like the inlet of a gas turbine. Atmospheric pressure, 12 degrees C. We're going to compress it up to basically eight atmospheres. So that'd be what eight times in psi. That would be like uh, well, from one atmosphere, which is 15 psi, to eight atmospheres, atmospheres, which is like 120. But that'd be 105 gauge pressure. These are always, anytime you're using ideal gas law, anytime you see that exponent in, the, in there, especially, it's all absolute temperatures and pressures. Keep that in mind. So, we want to find out how much work, uh, thermodynamic work we're doing, and how much actual shaft work it takes to get it done. The isentropic process, something with the same entropy, gets us uh, the best case, so 100% efficient case. And in the real world, we're only 80%. So where did that that go? <coughs> that actually just disappeared. There's a, a there was a data point um, with 80%. Isentropic efficiency, they knew that from the design of the, and it was on here just a minute ago, so who knows. Anyway, um, so that's what we're going to do here. How, uh, if, if you're in ideal gas, we can find a change in enthalpy if we do C sub P times delta T. Assuming C sub P is constant for a narrow enough Thing, that's that's the, that makes sense. If the C, if it's a wide enough temperature range, it'd still be C sub P times the delta C, but you might have to resort to the calculus, and it would be C sub P as a function of T times dT from one temperature to the next temperature, or one pressure to the next pressure. However, that works. Uh, well, it'd be temperature to temperature, and you'd have to calculate those endpoints. Uh, how are we going to calculate the endpoints? How do we get an isentropic process thing out of <coughs> ideal gas? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the first, some of the early slides in this chapter. That's my hint. <coughs> this page here, if you've got the uh, the, and I don't see a lot of that, but these notes that I have here, how many people know about Canvas? How many people, like, what? <laughs> All right. Go on to Canvas, and I've printed out the notes for you to use, if you choose to use them. And if you do, did choose to use them, then you can circle this, because this is how you correlate <coughs> volumes and temperatures and pressures for an isentropic process. So I was given pressures. I want to find temperatures because if I can chase temperatures around a, um, an air, a process using ideal gas, air standard, uh, they call it. If I can chase the temperatures around, then I can just do C sub P times delta T and my enthalpy has come out. I don't have to do any interpolations. Life is beautiful. So if you have it, circle this page on there, but basically, I'm going to use this right now. 
to find what my output temperature is in the best case. Um, so. And I started this, so I'm covering up the evidence. Basic process there. If I want to find my work, I need to find the temperatures. So T2 over T1 equals P2 over P1 K1 to the K1 over K exponent. Um, again, I'm not going to put in 12 degrees C. I better put in. Uh, P73 plus 12, P75. But what, where do you find the 1.4? It, it's given? It wasn't, it's a property of air, and it's a property of hydrogen, and it's a property, any N2, O2, H2, diatomic gases. Um, diatomic gases have a, the K is the ratio of specific heat, C sub P to C sub V. Enthalpy to internal energy, whatever you want to call it. Um, that it's actually literally calculated from C sub P divided by C sub V, and they both stand in for enthalpy, internal energy. Um, so that uh, turned out to be one. Thing. Basically, saying that enthalpy, uh, forty percent of enthalpy is probably work because the C sub V, which is part of it, is. Um, just the motion of the molecules, the actual energy in the molecule. Um, too confusing. Anyway, that's what's going on. Okay. Um, and based on the isentropic thing, we came up uh, isentropic relations and C to P versus ideal gas constant and all that. That's where this exponent came from. It's outlined in the book. I got 285 Kelvin times 8. Over one eight atmospheres over one atmosphere to the two seven <coughs> exponent gives me some new temperature. <coughs> when you compress something, it gets hot. Um, you notice this especially if you take a bicycle pump and try and pump up your car tire, which I had to do a couple times. And the bottom of the bicycle pump, where the compression is, it gets hot. It's too hot to touch if you do it long enough. Your pump is too small and your tire is too big. Um, so, who's got happy fingers? 516.3. That's Kelvin. The, eight over, the temperature is the 8. I mean, sorry, the pressure. Yeah, it was all given, right? Yeah, and the pressure was given. Okay. We had to know which pressure was 800. Going to. 800. Okay. Yeah. So, the work of the, the the thermodynamic work, minimum amount of work done to raise the pressure would be C sub P times that. Uh, C sub P for air is 1005, assuming we're in the right temperature. Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times 516.3 Kelvin minus 285 Kelvin equals C sub P delta T to some uh, 232 I'm guessing what do we get? I mean, half, a, half a percent bigger than the difference between these two that's about 231 all right. Now I really only have three digits worth of information here that's that's good, but I'll I'll keep that just for granted. Um, and frankly, I only really had two digits. It told me twelve degrees C. Um, I got kilojoules per kilogram is isentropic work.
So that would be the minimum amount of work to be done if your you know, if your thing was 100% efficient. Um, they did some things and found out that it was really only 80% efficient. Well, 80% of that. So it's not okay. 80% of that? No. This is this is 80% of how much work went in. Because this is what you got, and the work that you put in is what it costs you. So. The amount of work that got done is 80% of the actual. <coughs> to find the actual, we have to divide by 0.8. Which means uh, 258 plus that, so 290 ish. Thank you. And there's that's the total work. That's the total work shaft work that you had to do in order to get it up to pressure. And when you did that, the end broke the increase. It changes, you said. Yes, it always changes. It can only stay the same or increase in any process. So uh, if we were to unscramble all this and say, well, if that's the case, uh, we can back into, you know, that there's a couple ways we could write this. Um, <coughs> you know, we, we could have gone in. We could have done a couple things. We can solve this for what you know. I'm going to actually push it and say, what is my actual temperature? Um, because the actual work done was C sub P times the actual temperature minus the starting, the final temperature minus the starting. Or you could say it was C sub P times this is this is the isentropic amount of change in enthalpy and divide here like we did here. I could kind of use this relationship to solve for what was my actual temperature to A. So looking at these two equations which really say the same thing but we have data that we know now. I'm going to say temperature to A, <coughs> actual output temperature was and the C sub P's cancel, so we get T1 plus T2S minus T1 over that. We got 285 plus um, 516.3 minus 285. That was the actual temperature difference, but there was a bigger temperature difference. How much bigger? Well, this temperature, this is 80% of what the actual ended up being. So when you divide it by the 0.8, you get a bigger number. How much? 389.1. Oh, 289. Got it. And I'll just leave it with three digits. So, what does all that mean? Um, No, 289. Seems low. Yeah, it's higher, but it's not. It doesn't seem. This, it should be this. Yeah, let's, let's try that one again. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that's, yeah. It should be higher than 516. Oh, yeah, well, details. 
<laughs> Devil's in the details. Um, so instead of, so in a perfect world, we would have predicted it comes out in 516 degrees. <coughs> we measured the actual output, it came out with this this amount here. So theory says it should be the 516 degrees. Um, we measured the reality, and then because C sub P times temperature difference is the whole ball of wax, um, that's um, <laughs> our, that's where our efficiency, we can calculate an efficiency if we measure the output temperature and compare it to the theoretical. And then we can say, oh, I'm really good, I'm really efficient, more efficient than I expected, or wow, this is bad, I could be much better. And then we know if we've got a lot of work to do, or a little bit of work to do, or if it's hopeless, or if it's a good possibility. But um, isentropic would likely never be able to hit that, but it's, it's the only way we can find a point of reference which then we can use to figure out where did the it's, it's a thermodynamic limit essentially so um, <coughs> so that's how that one works I'll probably have these notes posted this afternoon, maybe not, by tomorrow anyway. Um, oh, total work. Um, I didn't do that number. So uh, the actual work done. Little w was um, two ninety point five, which is really more precision than we're entitled to, kilojoules per kilogram. How much power is it going to take? So there's work input, but if we have a mass flow rate. Um, we can talk in terms of the power. What's it? 2.2 kilograms per second. So we found out how much how much power we had to put into it. That was how much work it took to get the job done. Um, Power is going to be m dot times the work per unit, uh, specific work, work per kilogram. So if we do 0 0.20 kilogram per second, take it times 290 kilojoules per kilogram, and we get kilojoules per second. Fifty-eight points. I'm not going to say close to sixty because it's one fifth or close to three hundred, and that's yeah. Yeah, and fifty-eight. We we were already we really only had uh, two digits worth of information to start with, twelve degrees C and so forth. And what's a kilo? What's a joule per second? That's a watt, and we got a kilojoule. Don't don't forget the K's. Kilowatts. So we're talking fifty-eight kilowatts worth of power input to the compressor to make that happen. That's like a lot. That's a big compressor. So it's, you know, 105 psi gauge pressure at uh, 0.2 kilograms per second of air, which is uh, a pile. That's like, that would be like uh, Sucking all the air out of the big tank in the back of the room in uh, seven seconds or six seconds, something like that, because it's about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, and that's about a cubic meter. 
So. Okay. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about nozzles other than to say we could have a whole class on nozzles, except I couldn't teach it. Um, but it's especially important if you have things that are going high speeds, uh, like a turbojet engine, uh, especially a supersonic <coughs> one. There's all kinds of weird stuff that goes on, and there's, there's things they call pressure recovery. That's essentially what they're talking about here. The kinetic energy of, 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 the, of the air coming in compared to, um, they call it, uh, I want to say pressure capture, that's not right, pressure uh, something. Anyway, basically recovery, pressure recovery. <clears throat> if something's coming at you with a certain amount of speed, there's a dynamic pressure that goes with that. You know, that's related to kinetic energy. If it's uh, v squared over 2, rho v squared over 2 is dynamic pressure. And if you can capture all of that, life is good. But sometimes you can't capture all of that um, and make turn the most. So instead of having another compressor um, section, you can just have the nozzle, you know, big old nozzle that, that's, that captures as much air as you want. And the air comes in and, and essentially compresses because of its motion. And now it's like instead of a compression, <coughs> compression stage, you can use the kinetic energy of the flow. At supersonic speeds, you get into really issues with, with shock waves forming. And they do weird things to it. Um, if you want to confuse yourself thoroughly, uh, well, not really confuse yourself, let's say. I, I think you could, especially after you get <coughs> through fluids, you could probably puzzle through because um, we start, that's the basics of a lot of the ca calculations in the fluids is the dynamic pressure. But um, SR-71 uh, spy plane that went Mach 3 and change, um, there's presentations available on the internet um, talking about at high speed, the jet engine only provided something like 18% of the thrust, and the rest of it had to do with the things they were doing with the nozzles and super uh, um, afterburners and all sorts of things. And at takeoff, it was mostly about the engine, but it turned out the nozzle, how they did the nozzles was pretty complex at that speed. Uh, even weird things like, I was just reading recently on that one, um, you know, SR-71 is the well, you can't see very well, but it's that plane with the blue background there. And it, it had um, little conical uh, points that retracted in and out, depending on the speed, for the, in the inlet nozzle. And just because of the shape of the plane, the, the way the shock waves came at it, those nozzles weren't pointed straight ahead. They were pointed down and in a little bit. They looked a little bit knock-kneed and cross-eyed um, because the point of the plane would would send out shock waves that it was having to deal with. Um, anyway, that's what this is all about. Um, what kind of pressure recovery did you get based on what your dynamic pressure could be? Um, there's a total energy. It's not only the thermodynamic energy about the temperature and C sub P, but it's also, if you do this, you get kilojoules per kilogram. Actually, you get meters squared per second. <coughs> And when you multiply that times a kilogram and divide by a kilogram, something over itself is the same. You can get kilo, uh, joules per kilogram, which is the same units that we're using here, except we're using kilojoules. This is the total amount of energy, uh, thermodynamic plus kinetic energy. We won't push. We're, we got enough trouble with just doing what we're doing. Uh, in fluids, we spend a lot of time on this part of it. We don't really time together a lot. In 411, which is next hour, next year, um, we time them together a little more. Uh, so there are nozzles, uh, beware. And there's total <laughs> energy. And know about that. And, and preview of coming interactions. So here's kind of a summary. Work of the turbine, actual work over 
how much it could have done is going to be like that. For a compressor, the amount of work that uh, gets done, you have to put more work into it to make it happen. So notice that the actual versus the S are kind of, when you're putting work into the system, these are upside down. And kinetic energy versus isentropic energy, we won't deal with that so much, but uh, kinetic energy is another form of energy. Uh, we're just not studying it much in the thermodynamics class. And this whole entropy thing, we've been studying um, the thermodynamic part of the energy. Um, you can have a difference in entropy. And then there's also entropy that's generated. This would be due to the design. This is something you can can affect by you know making things smooth, porting and polishing your intake or whatever it is, you can make this number better. The closer the entropy gets to zero, the result conceptually, the better. Um, the thermodynamic limits of it that we're calculating um, from the isentropic processes, those are limits you 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 can't deal with those. Those are those are just hard limits given whatever property, temperatures or pressures you're running at. You can change them by you know, changing pressures or changing temper uh, temperature input. Uh, this is, is something about um, entropy generated. That's uh, <coughs> how efficient your pump is that maybe you can make better. But there are thermodynamic limits. You just can't. So. That's everything you need to know about <coughs> Chapter 8. What you going like to think? Um, oh. There's some sort of quiz or something on Monday. Oh, yeah. Monday there will be a quiz. And let me, uh, let me give you a hint. And really what it comes down to, this is sort of how the entropy was um, determined. They, they did this thing with a certain amount of heat flow happening, and there was a temperature at which it happens. It's an ideal or an uh, absolute temperature. That's um, So what we can say is for some process, um, change in entropy equals dq over t. Or we can say um, some heat flow could be temperature times ds. That's what I'm looking for when we do Monday. See how many people don't don't remember what that's about. That's the definition for entropy. Some sort of a heat flow is happening at some temperature. As the temperature gets bigger, the same amount of heat flow would have less entropy generated. As the temperature gets lower, this number gets bigger. And that's when that's why it sort of talks about the quality of the heat involved. And they, they actually, you know, this, this if, you, if you start from absolute zero and go up, or you start at whatever your reference point is, go up. For the steam table, it's ice water, and then you, you add a little bit of heat <clears throat> at that temperature, and you add a little more heat at another temperature. And I'm not an expert on how they generated the tables, but this is the theory. Um, but what that gets us to is if you want to know how much heat flow, temperature times ds will get you there. That's why we can have these charts that are temperature entropy charts. And if we outline the process on the chart, <coughs> T 
temperature times ds at this temperature, that would be like the, the work that um, this is the total work being, or the total heat that's being converted, I guess you could say. Is you can add these up, all these under here, and then come back this way, you got it the same thing you have to add under here, and it's different temperature, and that effect is this difference from here to here. These are all little BQs, and if you add up all the little differences in <coughs> heat, this is all the heat that's missing. Uh, and first law says what goes in must come out. We're going to balance it. We got heat that went in, we got exhaust heat, and if something's missing, it must have turned into work. On a pressure volume diagram, it's pressure times the change in volume, and you get the same deal. And now you're on a pressure volume diagram, you're looking at how much. We put this much work into it. We got this much work out of it. We got more than we bargained for. A certain amount of work got done. Where did it come from? It came from the TS diagram. This heat got converted into the work in the PV diagram. So we'll use both of these diagrams now that we can talk about that when we talk about engine cycles. So all of this, I'll say it's the sum of DQs. We're not going to actually do calculus with it. This is just talking about it. And the companion to it is the pressure volume diagram. And these are not necessarily uh, the way these particular ones work. But at some pressure, a change in volume means work that's being done. So this area here is the sum of all the little pieces of work. And these two. This is the work that magically showed up on the TS diagram. That's the heat that magically disappeared. So um, that's how we deal with that. Um, what's happening Monday is uh, we have the uh, ABET um, is the accrediting accrediting body for mechan our program, and we have. There's uh, three visitors uh, coming to review stuff, and they want to see you in this class. And I'm not entirely sure what the context is for that, but uh, um, I don't know if he's just observing it or if he's if I have to leave and he's going <coughs> to ask things of you guys or exactly how that works. Um, but at any, any rate, uh, we will have this quiz to make sure, first off, that you you at least know that this is something you need to know. And uh, take her from there. And um, so next week is the, uh, there will be a test in lab, which says it's today, but it's I sent out the email on that. And uh, next week is that lab. and. This week coming up is, or this lab is a combustion chemistry worksheet. Um, so make sure you print that out and bring that um, to lab. And that'll be something you complete in lab and then you're done. You don't have a report to write on that one. So, all right. Next topic. You guys are so lucky. This is why we're here. We are now gotten to the point in the course where we can start talking about um, <laughs> thermodynamics. What we've done up to now is talk about, again, we had two different worlds. We had the phase change world, uh, basically the steam and the refrigeration charts. And at some point in the process, you turn it into a liquid. Uh, and then at some point, you boil it and heat, superheat and all that. There's the ideal gas world, where ideal gas law takes care of a constant pressure or a constant volume or a constant temperature process. The fourth process is adiabatic, meaning no heat in or out, insulated. A special case of that is isentropic, and we have to use that one to find that, that fourth case of no heat flow. Uh, but it's an idealized one. Now <coughs> we're going to use that stuff. There is a, in your uh, 
Canvas, I don't know if it's under this chapter or or just extra resources, but there's uh, a summary of, of these engine cycles that are coming up now. We're going to study gas turbine, which is uh, Brayton cycle, auto cycle, that's gasoline engine, spark ignition, um, diesel cycle, otherwise known as compression ignition, um, Rankin cycle, which is steam turbines. Um, the difference between steam turbine and a gas turbine is the steam gets condensed into a liquid. And it's a lot easier to pump liquid to 10,000 PSI than it is to pump gas. Try and squeeze it. You know, just. So anyway, different. And then refrigeration, which is a Rankin cycle, but it's kind of operating in reverse. It generates heat and sucks out of the cold. Um, and some of them are, <clears throat> you can have open or closed cycles. If you gasoline engine, your piston pulls in the intake and then it closes. And from that point on, it's, it's a closed, the same amount of molecules, in theory, are in part of that cycle. So that's a closed cycle, as opposed to a uh, gas turbine on a 747 flying it to 30,000 feet. There's no chance that the, any molecule of air that was in there uh, a second ago is still in there at the end of the two seconds later. Uh, it's blowing through it, you know, super. So that's that'd be an open cycle. And then there's internal versus external combustion. You've probably heard people, oh, the internal combustion engines. Uh, just you know, in a gasoline engine, the the combustion happens inside the engine. It's part of the piston chamber. Where external combustion. Um, the steam power plant, it's got a boiler somewhere else. It's not part of the turbine. Even gas turbine is part of the engine, but it's not really part of the turbine. It's, gas gets compressed, it goes out into the combustion chambers, and it comes back as hot gas. But it's, it's, it is internal to the whole engine, but it's not internal to the turbine. So, uh, we're going to Idealize, we're going to simplify things so that we can handle them. Not just us, but everybody. Um, we're modeling them as an ideal cycle with a versatile process, uh, meaning isentropic. Um, we're ignoring the fact that there's a machine involved and there's machine <coughs> friction losses. We're only looking at the thermodynamics of the gas. We don't really care about how it's happening. Uh, the quasi-equilibrium expansion compression, that was a requirement for the reversibility of the isentropic process. It happens so slowly, there's no swirling going on. Does that happen? No. But we treat it like that. And then we say, this is the, the limit, and then we go test it and say, we're 18%, 16%, 37%, 92%, whatever it is, as good as the ideal. And then turns out things follow from that pretty well. We're not looking at heat losses going on and kinetic and potential energy. We're not dealing with that. We're just looking at the thermal energy. So one way we're going to simplify things too is it would be hard if you had two things coming in and a different thing going out. This is what we're actually going to do this in lab today. Um, model how that works. Um, how we're going to act, treat that, I mean, the combustion products come out with a different K. If it comes out with K, is it like 1.3, or is these would have a K factor of 1.4. Um, and we're not going to, we're, we're going to do just say, imagine your car engine, the piston comes up to the top under compression, and then we park it there long enough for enough heat to soak into gas so that it has as much heat as if you just flew, you know, fired off a combustion thing. So however much heat that 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 flame would have given us, we're just gonna say it magically appeared into the air, and the air comes out the other end. Does it really happen that way? Well, 
No. But it's not a bad, you know, we're still taking the amount of heat it took, and this is still going to come out that hot. It's going to go up to that pressure. Uh, so um, it's one source of error, but it still gets us um, something to grab onto so we can do the analysis. Um, for there's, we're going to do for the auto cycle, for the diesel cycle, for the Brayton cycle, we're going to do an air standard analysis, which is exactly like that. Air comes in, magically gets hot, and air goes out. And then instead of an exhaust going away and then coming back, some, we're going to say that it comes around and we're going to magically just wait until it cools down to intake temperature and pressure. And then, then we start the cycle over. Um, so we're doing just doing heat flow instead of um, combustion and a heat flow instead of instead of basically what's going on with the exhaust. It's hot exhaust comes out and then we pick up some cold air and start over. Um, so it's all about heat exchangers. Carnot cycle, which we started talking about, um, this is the limit of um, because it has isotropic process here and isotropic process here and a constant temperature here. You can't get something more efficient than this cycle. There could be other cycles that are also 100% thermodynamically efficient. Um, they're not going to be more than efficient than this. This one's a nice one. <coughs> so this is the way it looks on a pressure volume diagram. Remember the, the circle we're drawing around there leads us to how much work got done. This was the work we had to put into it. That's the work we got out of it. And the difference between that's the work, that's the same as the area here. This is the heat we put into it. Here's the exhaust. <coughs> the heat that's missing is what turned into work that we to kind of get together. And um, the Carnot efficiency, the best efficiency for any thermodynamic engine you can get, would be 1 minus the ratio of the temperatures has to be in absolute temperatures. So degrees Kelvin or degrees Rankin for this to work out. Um, that's the best case. No one's made one that actually works like that. So now let's talk a little bit about engines themselves. Um, so we have a little bit of the terminology. Um, Or uh, area times how far the piston moves is their displacement. There's also clearance at the top. So up here, there's uh, here's the displacement. There's the, the bore area, and then there's also an area up here that is uh, clearance. Top dead center is when it comes all the way to the top, but it doesn't go all the way to the top. That's just the top of its stroke. And then bottom dense, dead center is at the bottom of the stroke. Um, and it's going around and around. Um, there is a clearance volume. And at the bottom of the stroke, we have the displacement plus the clearance volume. Remember that. Somebody, I guarantee you, like, 10 or 15 percent or more of you will, will have a test and you'll you'll just say it's this one, but it's both of these together. At the top of the stroke, it's that much. <coughs> just the clearance. Here it's clearance plus the displacement. And the compression ratio, which turns out to be very um, <coughs> critical in the basic analysis, the air standard analysis of the efficiency of the engine, uh, of the cycle, is going to be related to this. So compression ratio is not about pressure. It creates pressure. It's about volume. Really, it's, it's, it's a volume ratio. And the volume is clearance plus displacement divided by the clearance. Um, So that's our compression ratio, about volume. 
pressure isn't going to go up like that, because ideal gas law, if you do that, you're going to find the pressure rises more. And there's something called a mean effective pressure. If you do a bunch of work on this piston, it does a cycle. Let's get maybe a little bit ahead of where we need to be on this, but um, if you take uh, if you had a certain amount of pressure working on this piston, a fixed pressure pushing on it, what would that pressure be over this displacement? It gives you the same amount of work, pressure times volume. So really what you do is you take, remember, pressure times volume, times the change in volume gave us work. We'll just back <coughs> that up and say what pressure would give us this same amount of work over that same volume. So you divide, it's really how much work's done per unit volume. But it comes out in units of pressure, because this would be newton meters per meter cube, or newtons per meter squared. That, you can compare how hard an engine's working. You can compare a diesel locomotive to a weed eater, a different size, because it's how hard is each, each CC producing energy or producing work. Um, so now let's get into the cycles. In an auto cycle, you have four processes. You have a compression stroke, which is isentropic. Here's, imagine this is the piston going back and forth. Here's volume. It starts at the bottom dead center, comes up to top dead center, and comes from the, this point up to here isentropically. Now, is it going quasi equilibrium really slow? No, it's not. What's the other requirement? It's adiabatic, meaning no heat flow in or out. If your engine's going fast enough, how much time does it have for it? The heat to go, to leave, the, you compressed the air, it got hot. How much time is there for the air, the hot air, to to leak some heat out of it? Like Three thousand RPM. Not very much time. Does it happen? Yeah, your engine gets warm. But once your engine's up to temperature, it happens even less. Um, so that part of this isentropic thing, the fact that there's no heat flow in or out, you're just putting work into it, staying in it. That's probably pretty good. Approximation. So we can we'll use that gets us the best thing here for no heat flow in and out. The pressure is going to rise, and so does the temperature. And then magically we wait until the heat comes in. Well, in in the real world, how does the heat come in? We give it a spark. Spark happens usually a little bit before top dead center because it takes a while for the, the flame to start to go and then it propagates and then it burns and it, you know, and I don't know how many milliseconds. But <coughs> think about the motion of a sinusoidal curve. At the top 10 degrees on either side, it kind of goes, doesn't move much. It's almost parked. So a constant volume heat addition, that's not unreasonable. That's pretty, that's a reasonable thing. And then isentropic power stroke. Again, no heat in or out. All of the heat that went, that you added here is expanding there. Again, it's going so fast, there's no heat flow in or out. So it's that sort of that insulated adiabatic insulation uh, restriction. That's pretty good. Um, and then for the exhaust, uh, it magically comes out at some pressure or temperature here and it waits, you know, ideally <coughs> it waits for everything to cool down as it comes out through a heat exchanger. Well, how do we do that? We just open up an exhaust valve uh, and push out the hot air and suck in the cold air and now we're back to the beginning. So this is how it looks the way we do it. This is sort of the real cycle. There's two strokes to take care of. This exhaust <laughs> and that's enough for today.